Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Welcome to Tate Modern. My name's Richard Martin. I'm curator of public programs here at Tate. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this open discussion on art and inequality. There are too many occasions, I know, when we have talks and events in this auditorium when we don't make enough time for questions or responses or contributions from the audience. Tonight is very different. This is a discussion framed around your questions, your ideas, your concerns. So at the outset, I want to encourage all of you to bring your voices to this evening's discussion and to join our brilliant panelists here in thinking productively about some vital and complex issues. Simply raise your hand when you'd like to speak and we'll make sure a microphone reaches you at the soonest available moment. We're talking this evening about the relationship between art and inequality and we're not short on evidence that inequalities, whether across class, race, gender, sexuality or ability, continue to shape art and its institutions. So, for instance, just recently, a new report commissioned by the Freelance Foundation revealed a growing gender disparity in major London galleries. The report confirmed that in 2017, female students studying creative arts and design continued to outnumber men, but men outnumbered women in having solo exhibitions at national galleries in London and in having commercial gallery representation. Another recent report, appropriately entitled Panic, has highlighted how unrepresentative UK creative industries are in terms of their workforce, with women, people from working class backgrounds, and black, Asian, and minority ethnic workers all facing significant exclusions. Tonight, we have the opportunity to talk about these continuing inequalities and wider issues in the UK and beyond. How might artists respond to inequality or shape political and economic debates in this area? What impact might art institutions have in tackling social divides? Or how might art and its institutions actually perpetuate rather than reduce inequalities? These are large and complex questions and we obviously don't expect to cover or resolve everything this evening. And that's why I'm glad to say that this evening's discussion is part of a new series of events developed by Tate in partnership with the Atlantic Fellows for Social and Economic Equity at the LSE's International Inequality Institute. Some of you attended a workshop this afternoon when a range of international artists, curators, activists and academics began the day's discussions on inequality. And I want to thank the LSE and particularly Clive Nwonka for their commitment, their collaboration and their generous support for these events. This is a new partnership and it's one we very much hope to extend in the future. But there's obviously an irony in an event on inequalities being organised by such powerful institutions as Tate and the LSE. As I said this afternoon, we don't approach this discussion from a position of innocence or naivety when it comes to the historical inequalities involving these institutions, and we're also very aware of the ongoing work that we still need to do. Through this programme, we plan to give a platform to some of the most vital voices and engaged practitioners from around the world who have been thinking about these issues throughout their careers. And I'm delighted that we have such a terrific panel to lead our discussions this evening. You'll be properly introduced to Bonnie Greer, Jacob V. Joyce and Andrea Phillips in a moment. And I want to thank all of them for joining us this evening. But I want to pay particular tribute to our chair for tonight, Badisha, who has been extremely generous with her thoughts and her time in shaping this evening. I'm sure she'll be familiar to many of you from her poetry, her journalism, and her broadcasting on television and radio. She's recently directed her first short film entitled An Impossible Poison, which received its London premiere in March at the Royal Albert Hall and is being screened at festivals all around the world. We're thrilled that she's here to guide our discussions this evening. Thank you all for coming. I look forward to hearing your questions and comments as the evening develops. And please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Badisha and the rest of our panel. Uh, 
Hello everyone, thanks for being here. I'm delighted slash mortified by that introduction. Uh, welcome to this open discussion on art and inequality. We've framed it as a non-combative question time in which our panel chronicles solutions and possibilities. I'll give an introduction, then introduce our panelists, Bonnie Greer, Jacob V. Joyce and Andrea Phillips. And then we're away. First of all, thank you for being here and thank you for sticking with us all afternoon if you did so. While it's always illuminating to be part of a sharing circle, uncovering obstacles and inequalities and talking about what's problematic, we want to harness the expertise in the room to look at what can actually now be done. Present today are artists, gallerists and curators, commentators and journalists, academics and researchers, institutional leaders and grassroots activists and members of the public who are not directly involved in these worlds but are passionate supporters and visitors and want to see the art world questioning and transforming itself. We know that the wider the lens, the greater the net, the broader the vision, the more exciting the work. Variety creates richness, not dilution. Fighting deliberate and unconscious barriers based on sex, race, class, ability, location or anything else does not taint or degrade an art form but raises it up so that the wider world can enjoy the full spectrum of excellent work being made and enjoy support by the sector so that artists can have careers in which they craft a body of work. So many public events these days make dark references to the troubling times we live in, and I won't lay out those troubles since we're all highly aware of them, except to note that at a national level, and in terms of the stability and openness of the international community, it's up to everyone who is concerned about the way things are going to find some way of enacting solutions. Instead of letting ourselves be paralyzed by fatalism into doggedly carrying on the way we always have done, or hunkering down and hoping hoping for the best. The world is changing and it's our job to change it for the better in whatever field we're in. But how do we get there? This session follows an afternoon of workshops, provocations and presentations by curators, artists and academics. Some of the comments and questions I've heard throughout the day include the following. How do we embody solidarity? Why are we ghettoized into education, community, outreach and racial diversity projects, areas which have lower prestige, lower or no pay and lower visibility relative to the other major roles in art institutions? Art is not neutral, it either upholds or disrupts the status quo. There's a lot of responsibility and difficulty in doing radical work while carrying the flag of a well-known institution, particularly if you're the only one doing so. How do we fill in the gaps left by the withdrawal of resources by the state? How do we share the work that we do? How can we avoid the where are you from questions which set up power relations from the start? Has diverse become a synonym for non-white, for deviating from the norm, from, for the other? The institutions that we're excluded from are paid for by us through our taxes. How can we hold them and each other accountable so that we follow our stated policies of equality and inclusion? Is the bottom line economics or is it the common good? Who is not in the room and why? Are we allowed to be artists if we don't focus our work on colonialism, slavery, identity, oppression, inequality, suffering and other forms of violation and exploitation? How do we interrupt as well as work with the established Western canon and how do we get beyond a hemispheric way of looking at art history? Is feeling empowered the same as actually having power? How can we change our art world overlords when it makes both us and them uncomfortable? Is gentrification the new form of colonialism, annexation and ethnic cleansing? Is change as much about listening as speaking? How do we carve out an artistic space, occupy it, create from it and preserve it as a source of power which is permanent and recognised? Is it bourgeois to focus on and talk about art when individuals are facing much more grave and immediate threats like deportation and police harassment? Does didactic art always fail? Do we need to get away from the binary of periphery versus the centre? And have we internalised a feeling of inferiority, a sense of being on the periphery? Is it worth banging on a series of doors that will never open? 
Do we need to change our language or even stop discussing and conferencing altogether? How can we be pragmatic? What do we have and what do we do with it? Can art really be used for the good and for the better? Can we use it to politicise people or is art also a tool of soft power and social repression? Is it a mistake to see art as an end rather than a means or a process? How do we engage with institutions that are designed to exclude us? Is it okay to work from a position of anger? How do we avoid moralising patronage and paternalism? How can artists make money? How can we preempt and set up our own power dynamics in terms of engagement? What would happen if institutions gave the tools of change to their own employees? Can we refuse to do the emotional labour of helping to diversify institutions? How do we overturn the piecemeal unpaid or underpaid gig economy for arts workers? Are identity and representation debates simply a fashion by institutions anxious to defend their credentials without changing? Is it time to dismantle the necessity for masters and doctorates in art history, fine art or curation? Can grassroots tactics work with or against institutions or do institutions de-radicalise grassroots approaches? Who are the invisible censors and vested interests like board members and senior management within institutions? How do we advance the rights of people to represent themselves without thinking of them as them, especially when looking around the room, them is usually us? Is working for diversity just another type of colonial performance commissioned by white people and played out by non-white people? And how do we keep all those questions in mind while still loving the power and the beauty and the complexity of art? To carry those ideas forward, we are honoured. <laughs> To quickly answer all of those questions, we're honoured to have with us Bonnie Greer, Andrea Phillips and Jacob V. Joyce. Bonnie Greer is a playwright, a critic, a long-time broadcaster and a columnist on everything from the arts and culture to international affairs and social justice. Jacob V. Joyce is an interdisciplinary artist whose practice includes illustration, performance, fine art, zine production, music and theatrical intervention to comment on everyday marginalisation and bias. Dr. Andrea Phillips is a professor at Northumbria University and Baltic Centre for Contemporary Art, lecturing and writing about constructions of public value within contemporary art. We have until 8pm to tackle, no, I mean solve art and inequality. And we hope to close the session on a note of determination, practicality, enthusiasm and good faith with a sense of possibility, not of being under attack or facing impossible odds. I'm going to ask you for your opening thoughts on how you would approach the issue of art and inequality. Then we're going to go straight to the audience. Audience, please, we want to hear from as many people as possible. So. Keep your questions brief and to the point, and please do frame them as questions, and we will try and tackle everything you've got. First of all, Bonnie Griff, I could come to you. Yes. You heard that long list of provocations that we gleaned from the I've afternoon's conference. I've heard these conference. before, I have to of say. Of course you have. Not How are you really. now approaching it? We're, now we're on to our second or third round of talking about diversity across the decades. <laughs> Bonnie. Well, you know, I was, uh, like a week ago, I thought to myself, this is a big birthday this year. You're going to be 70 years old. Now, look at your life. What have you done? What have you not done? When will you grow up? Because that's important. <laughs> so I made this arc of my decades. And I thought, right, when I finally was able to like sort of escape from home, uh, this is the 70s. And I went right into the visual arts, although I'd had no training. But it was a good time because uh, women were being, we were beginning to express ourselves. And also it was the, the Pan-African movement. I, was, I just was with Shinka Yinka Sholibari the other day and we were talking about Festac. He was a little boy when it happened. I remember it as a teenage, uh, a young woman. And so these kind of, these two things were sort of the driving thing for me this kind of pan-Africanist, big world idea, which was very positive, very strong, very, you know, I'm throwing the word vibrant, and never say that word again in front of me, but very strong. And this Is idea- vibrant and rich and colorful? Yeah, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> and this idea of women, or woman, being able to do anything. And that's how I came up. So I started making theater, 
And I got trapped into the kind of thing where, as a black woman, I'm supposed to make this kind of theater. This is what I'm supposed to make. And of course, you start doing it because you get paid and also you get produced. So if you want to do something else, you don't get recognized because you know the shapes of the, par the parameters are there and that's where you're supposed to fit. Although my interest was not in the kind of what I would call the American kitchen sink, picket fence kind of thing, I wanted to do something different. I got trapped in that because that's what they accepted. Then when I moved here to escape, to be honest with you, um, I, dis I, I discovered that being a black woman writer, you could only do so much. You had to be in another kind of box. And I decided to escape that. And I think um, what I've come to the conclusion, also being on several boards as well, is that you always got to be a little bit outside. You can't be too inside. And I think what, what, what's happened, especially from the 80s and the 90s, is that people have been so educated that you don't sometimes uh, think that you've gone anywhere until you got the MFA, if you got the, you know, the show, if you got all this, and you lose track of what you're actually doing. And um, I mean, I'm starting to confront that in myself, even at this age and stage. And I think it's very important, and I would say, and I think it's true, the good thing about being a, a, a woman and being a woman of color, you can actually do this, and you can al always do it. Stay out. Don't be in. Even if you are in, don't ever be in. It's very important because otherwise, if you're inside, you, you, lose, you lose the light that's actually guiding you. Because what, what happens is, uh, part of being an artist, part of being a painter or a sculptor, a dancer or a writer or whatever, is that there is a business of that as well. So it's actually constantly got to codify and explain who you are. So I would say as much language that you can make uh, as an artist, as a creative, as much stance that you can make outside, the better and the stronger your work will be, the longer you'll live as an artist, I think. Jacob. Wow. Um, yeah, I totally feel really like a similar vibe at the moment. I'm really um, staying with this feeling of being an imposter um, in spaces and trying to really like, you know, embrace that actually. And being like, why do I not feel welcome in this space? And then being like, well, actually, maybe there's a reason. You know, so I just finished a residency at Nottingham Contemporary Gallery. And the residency was in, in, in a response to an exhibition that was there called The Place Is Here, which is lots of like black and, and brown uh, British artists um, who inspire me a great deal. Um, so I chose to do the residency um, with elder people um, in, in Nottingham. So I went to a centre, which is a, a, a day at the ACNA Centre, the African Caribbean National Arts Centre, but it's basically a day centre for elders where they play dominoes and they have tea and, you know, it's, it's, it's called the African Caribbean Centre, but really it's the um, Jamaican centre. Um, they're, they're all Jamaican. <laughs> Let's be precise here, right? <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, when I was doing art workshops with them, getting to know them, before any of that, I was listening to their stories and getting to know them and, and just really enjoying all the amazing history of Nottingham. But then members of the gallery came and were like, you know, we'd really like you to come and make this kind of work with Jacob at the gallery. And they were like, you know, what's the catch? And they were absolutely right to ask that question because what is the catch? You know, why, you know, it's an, it's an engagement program, you know, this, that and the other. And I chose to make sure that there was no pressure on people and supported by Nottingham Contemporary, mind you. Like there was no, they didn't pressure too much when, they, when myself and the people I was working with said, we don't want to work in the gallery. Um, we want to make a mural here. We want to do art workshops here. We want to like stay with that feeling of like, what is the catch actually? That suspicion. Um, because although, and I'm continuing to work with them after the residency is over. So you know, maybe one day we, we are actually planning to do something in the gallery now that there's been that time. Very, very briefly, can I just ask you to unpack that suspicion of what the catch would be? Is it a wariness of what? somehow being co-opted by this 
Ponzi gallery space. Yeah, I, I think Nottingham Contemporary is pretty good, actually. But Not that uh, I'm saying that the Nottingham Contemporary, but, I mean just... A, but yeah, I think, it, it, you know, a lot of those people, elder Caribbean people, yeah, they just don't feel yeah. like it's a space for them. Um, and don't feel like, and, 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 it, and it literally isn't as well. Yeah. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't. I don't want to go, like, say anything negative about Nottingham Contemporary because I no, do no, think no. there's a good staff there, and they are trying to do some good stuff. But as you, as we all know, there's a reason why people want black people in galleries, and it's mm -hmm. often to tick a box to, yeah. for a certain set of quota or funding things, and you know that's not something that they, they were just like, well, what's in it for us? Yeah. And why should they as old people have to walk across town to, yeah. to, to a gallery and do some art there when they yeah. can do it in a place where they feel comfortable? And why should we have our happy, smiling, shiny faces used in a brochure for other Ex people to get funding? Exactly. Um, and I think I have to kind of like recognize my relationship to this space, the Tate. Um, the last time I was here, I was doing workshops with young people um, and I was asked to be in the education department to do, you know, work with young people and I chose to make a piece of artwork with young people about the lack of black British artists in this institution. So I researched and at the time um, there was over 3,850 something artists in the Tate's collection, under 10 of them were black British artists. So I put a call out to different um, black British artists and I said, if you would like your work to be the inspiration for a mural that I'll be making over three months with the young people in the Tate, um, send me your work, flooded with things, and we created three big murals in the, in the, in the Tate um, to kind of like, uh, I guess, it show young people that black British artists do exist. There's loads of them, and there's a long, long history of it. And I guess to kind of not be used to invisibilize, yeah. you know, tokenism. And also to punch up. Huh? Also to punch up, and to say in. something, and lean, lean in, in, and all the yeah. other things, to say in. something, to make a statement, and to lean in the powers that be. Uh, Andrea, very, very briefly, I'm sorry, um, before we open up. I was going to pick up on something you just said, which is, um, I'm going to misquote you now, so correct me, but you said something like, um, I, um, I don't want to diss Nottingham Contemporary because it's full of really good people and they're really trying hard to do mm -hmm. something. Yeah, I mean, a, 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 and I'm one of those people. I'm white, I'm middle class, I'm here on the panel, and I'm one of those people that works in institutions, whether they be educational institutions or artistic institutions or the, on the boards of institutions. I'm on the board. And we work hard, and we try and, we try and do things, mm -hmm. okay? But it's not good enough. Huh? Because inequality is systematic and structural, and it is also intersectional, yeah? It yeah, we know. Yeah. Of course you know, but I mean, I don't just mean it's intersectional in relationship to race, class, it's also geographically intersectional. I mean, it's, the intersections are a myriad, okay? And until we can understand that structural understanding of it, it unless, until we can get our heads around that, then institutions aren't going to be able to grasp how they need to change. And people like us who work on boards, who work in and out of institutions, and really, really importantly, who run BA, MA, PhD programs, foundation level programs, actually the most important people, I think, the people that work in primary schools in the UK, we really need to change education to be able to achieve a different understanding of what art workers are and should be. And value and inequality are both produced at the level, and this is a kind of sociological kind of framework, I guess, um, uh, they're often talked in sociological terms at being produced at the level of consumption and production. Okay, so you know you have um, inequality produ produced at the level of con consumption. Some people feel able to go into Nottingham Contemporary or Tate. Other people don't. Yeah, you also have it, uh, and some people feel that they have the language to understand art. Let's say, for instance, at the moment we're just sitting in Tate, visual art, performance art, and some people don't. But it's also at the level of who can access the ability to conceive of themselves as art workers in the very beginning. And so I think that, can, that, that structurally, if we want to tackle inequality, then we need to work at the level of the administration and management of organisations such as Tate to change the conditions that enable us to move forward. And that means just to throw one out there, not taking on board the creative case for diversity 
as it is meted out at the moment, which is the, the way in which um, people that get money from the Arts Council, uh, so not Tate, because it it's directly funded by the government, but sm smaller organisations like Nottingham Contemporary ha have to fill in something called the creative case for diversity. And I think that actually organisations and boards need to take responsibility for saying, actually, the creative case for diversity isn't good enough. And that is something that we could all agree to do as a viable outcome for the end of this conversation. Bonnie, hang on to your answer and we'll try and work it neatly into what is about to happen, which is that we had promised this would be a kind yeah, of yeah. open forum, so we really want to receive from you. First person is always the bravest. We have got roving mics. Please wait for them to come around because this is being recorded and we have the audio to be clear. Right there, great. Thank you. Um, you can be the last to well, thank you all. For me, I'm so grateful to be here listening to you. Um, I'm a little bit nervous because I'm the first one and I know I'm also not an English speaker. But um, I was at the workshops today earlier and I wanted to ask this question. And I was thinking, I'm very interested in utopias and imagining, utopias. imagining this future. And I just wanted to know your thoughts, um, almost like a gut feeling, because we're having this conversation and I keep getting this feeling that we should get a little bit you know, radical or revolutionary. And I just wanted to know if there's something that comes to mind when I ask, do you, if, when you envision a future, what, do you, what does it look like? Question. Wonderful. That's exactly the question Wonderful. we would have we would have dreamt for: radical Wonderful. futures, Wonderful. utopian visions, imagined futures, <laughs> revolutions. <laughs> Bonnie. Wonderful. Thank you so much yeah. for that. Good because call. that's the one thing about people of color and women: we ain't never in the future. Forget all of this. I think that that. When I went to see Black Panther, okay, now I never go to the movies, and I went to see Black Panther. And I'm standing out here in, you know, with a bunch of other people who I could tell, we went at one o'clock in the afternoon, I could tell they don't go to the movies either. <laughs> but we just had to go see this movie. And so I'm sitting there in the middle of it, and I'm thinking, you know, what I've been doing all of my life is creating this black phantasmagoria that I've been trying to sell to people in, you know, in the industry. I, you know, I never actually, I don't give a shit about any of this. I love being in the tape, but I don't care about it. Do you see what I mean? So I've always, and I love the tape. I've always wanted to make this world that was my own, just my own thing. I, had, I have this theater that I make and I also paint in it. I make music. That's my world. And my duty is to my world. It's not to an institution or to even expressing it or making language for it. My duty is to my world. And that's the first thing I would say to all of you from this part of my life. Don't lose your duty to your world. And that is your first allegiance, your last allegiance, and it's the last thing you're gonna see before you die is your own world. So we've got to project, protect our, project ourselves into the future. It's very, very important because we don't do that, our world is not going to exist, our practice isn't going to exist, it's just not going to exist. Jacob, Andre, can you top that? Um, I don't think I can top it, but um, <laughs> I, that's, that, what you said really resonated yeah, again and the question I think is a really great question and it's like I feel like I'm just about to start a job here at the Tate in the education department um, <laughs> for, for a year um, and job. I mean, you know I'm, I'm happy saying, yeah, go for like it. my mum sent a bouquet of flowers to my yeah, house she was right? like yeah yeah it's a job oh, stick with it my family is overjoyed and I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, happy too job, gotta eat. Um, but you know yeah, what but one yeah, no, exactly and what one of the things I'm really happy about having this job is um because I've been freelance so so oft for, for God, about eight years now, doing art here, art there, oh, art, just God. constantly, constantly, sometimes not having weekends, because you have to just keep taking jobs in case there's nothing. And in between, I went on holiday, actually, with my mum for Christmas, and I just like, oh, I'm on holiday, I'm going to, like, make, because I make comics. I was like, oh, I'm going to make a comic, what do I want to make? And I was like, ooh, I'm going to make a comic about if Doctor Who was black. Um, That's great. Because what if we could just go back, and, you know, the first, the first comic is someone being, like, Doctor, Doctor, like the Daleks are, are destroying uh, Victorian Britain and Doctor's like, that's in the past. That's right. 
Because, you know, if do- who gives a- why should we care, you know? Yeah. Um, fuck the Victorians. Yeah, and the Doctor's right. black exactly. doctor. Exactly, exactly, um, so, exactly. And my Doctor Who, my black Doctor Who comic, you know, Marsha P. Johnson, um, they're like, the, the queer activist who started Stonewall yeah, is, is yeah, his assistant. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, yeah. And it's like, I started making this comic and people were like, I fucking love the comic. Yeah. People loved it. And I was like, well, this is what I'm doing in my spare time because I finally don't have to just work, 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 yeah. work, work. So in my spare time, I, that's what I'm trying to do. You know, now that I have spare time, I can start making my comics, which are about the future and are about, you know, utopias, because I do think that art for me is a tool of creating a world that I, I want to see, Almost, and that's why... What else is the point, you know? Exactly, exactly, no, I don't understand. I mean, obviously you can use it to empower, to critique, to subvert and all this stuff, but that's labor that I'm world. doing in my daily life just to not feel, you know, world. shit anyway. So in, in my artwork, I want to be able to create a utopia, basically. Um, and that's why people like Octavia Butler and, um, you know, not so many other Afrofuturists, because a lot of the worlds they create are pretty bleak. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think the idea of a utopia is like a, a definite... Like, most important. It's the most important thing. And I think when I get all of the shit away, that's what I want, that's what I have time to create. Like something, a world that I would like to see. Um, and that comic is on my Instagram, so you, you, can, um, you can read it for free. Um, Andrea. Okay, I'm going to be very quick. Very so brief, because I want to hear more. Yeah, from the but audience. I would say, um, I can tell I'm just going to be the pragmatist this evening, but I'm going to say, um, yes, um, radical futures, fantastic, but what do we work, so it's a question, do we work with the institutions we have to get there, or do we just m- move around them or outside of them? So that's a kind of question, in a sense, that I think we have to tackle as a community, if we want to create solidarities, is do we go through the institutions and try and change them? Or do we go, actually, they're all worth squat and we need to do something different? And there's so that question quite... of making a living. I mean, it's yes, just absolutely. so pleased that Jacob has a job. It's, because... it's absolutely. It's, of course it's about making a living. And it's also about, yeah, I mean, so we also need to think there's a world of work out there and artists are workers in the same way that Lots of other people are workers. And actually, sometimes I think artists should remember that they're workers like other workers, you know. So should unionise for sure. Yeah, absolutely. 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 I I agree. Yeah. Bit of nascent clapping that immediately got quietened down (laughs) at the front. Hi, good evening. Um, So I'm a teacher. I was born in Hackney. I work in Dagenham. Uh, I'm an English teacher. My friend here is an art teacher. Um, So up and down... um, well, from what I know, uh, southeast of England, a lot of arts uh, departments are being cut. <laughs> um, my colleague here, Jack, his classes are going to go from being 15 to 30 year sevens or year tens running around. Um, and uh, materials being cut, whether it's PVA, uh, a glue, paint, paint brushes, they're having to go to Wilkinson's and all this stuff. Um, I think uh, when I walk around the playground and I have a look at these children, they have raw emotions and art is uh, its meant to be a visual representation of uh, emotions, experiences and so on. However, this summer, i uh, sorry, this spring rather, I went to Italy and with Jack and he took me to the Uffizi Gallery. I was absolutely overwhelmed by this Renaissance art and all the history, the names, the, the yes, we must praise them. And I was a bit annoyed actually. At one, We had to go there twice. At one point I didn't feel too well in there. <laughs> and I just saw loads of people sort of glaring and almost looking at these pieces of art as, 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 as God's work. And uh, I just find it, and I'm 28. So for me, it was my first sort of, I love art, um, things that I can relate to perhaps, um, street art maybe. Um, uh, There was a piece up there actually of uh, two black women there, which uh, would be seen maybe as amateur. Um, And I think the fine lines and the straight lines and all of this can confuse children and there's no space for them. Um, So I just wonder, why do you think we should bring art to the living rooms or to the classrooms of um, these underprivileged young people? What do you think will, uh, they will benefit from it? And is it accessible to us? I'm 28, uh, Londoner, born in Hackney, raised in Hackney. Um, I never knew, I knew about Renaissance literature. I'm an English teacher here. You. I think uh, let's yeah. go to Andrea first and then we'll come okay. back around. Very, I'm going to try and be here, so. Yes, pragmatist. So, um, so I, the reason that, I don't know whether we should introduce it to living rooms, but I think that the reason that we should uh, keep it in 
the primary and secondary school um, uh, curriculum, which doesn't necessarily mean we could like not have as much of it in higher education, as far as I'm concerned. That's me doing myself out of a job. Um, is because um, you can access tools of imaginative problem solving, learning, reconfiguring, radically turning things up and down. And those are the skills that one learns through art. And you'll know this, Jack, the silent partner there. <laughs> but, but the one, I'd just like to give one example, Please. which is that, um, uh, and I don't know too much about it, I'm kind of writing about it at the moment, but the Liverpool Biannual, which is a regular biannual, it's about to happen, everybody should go to Liverpool, it's very good. Um, it, on the back of the Liverpool Biannual's education program, which runs across all the time, so not doesn't just like do the star attraction at that oofitsy moment that biannuals are supposed to provide, um, have managed to persuade Liverpool City Council to reintegrate A into, and you'll know this as educators, STEAM, um, to make STEM back into STEAM. So instead of it, because the government wants it to be science, technology, engineering, maths, and the Liverpool Biennial, on the back of all the kind of high profile cultural work, you know, famous artist commissions, has gently reintroduced, but most importantly, convinced the governance of the city to back them in reintroducing the A into. So I think that we can, so that's my pragmatics. Um, yeah? Jay, you can, can reintroduce it. Jacob and Bonnie, I'd, I'd put that question to you, but also maybe look at the relevance of the syllabus, that maybe it's not just about bringing it back into primary and secondary yeah. education, it's also about tweaking that syllabus, yeah, so it does true. actually speak to young yeah. people. It doesn't feel like some alien thing made mm. in Florence in the 15th and 16th century. Mm. Uh, I, I uh, got my, um, my papers, as they say, to stay here in this country, because I taught Shakespeare, and I was determined that I wasn't going to deprive anybody of that beauty, mm. but I gave it to them in their way. So to deny anybody Michelangelo, and that grasp, his hand, the power, the length, the strength, everything that goes into making that hand of Adam reaching God, our job is to let them encounter that. You don't have to put a whole lot of that's better than what you do, let them see it, because you never know how a child or anybody else reacts to something. That, this, this, the Uffizi is very important, not because of the people who are there, but because it's a door. It's a door. And, and it's very important as a teacher to be able to open as many doors as you can because you don't know who's in that room. You don't know who they are. And so how many doors we can open is most important. So. I think I know it's overwhelming because you go in there and it's like well, like that, but but the the work and the detail of the work, not the kudos of the work, take all that shit away and take people in and say look look at this look at that hand and look how we did it. Jacob. Um, so I've been working in secondary schools um, on behalf of galleries, so going into secondary schools, and I think it's, I almost feel like it's, it feels like an act of terrorism, like what's happening, like the way that um, you're being expected to now teach 30 children um, art, as if they're gonna listen, and as if you're gonna be like, you know, I've, when I do art workshops, I've been doing art workshops in youth centers for almost a decade, and I always make sure that it's the young people who want to do it, who do it, because otherwise no one will be able to. So you can't focus 30 people's attention and get them to try and understand something critically and creative at the same time. It's impossible. And the, the, it's the school that I was working at, I was, wouldn't name it, but they can't keep art teachers for longer than a year. Yeah. They quit because it's just awful. And my it's friends awesome. who are going into teaching are quitting as well. And I think it's, it's an act of terrorism on creativity because I think, you know, I got kicked out of school when I was at school. I got kicked out when I was 15 and art was one of the only things that I was good at. And it was one of the only things that made me realize that even though I wasn't like welcome in school, I could go on to, to college and then to university and now have a residency at the Tate. Um, so I think it's, it's really, really, really empowering. Like, I think it goes without saying how empowering art can be for people um, who especially struggle with other subjects. Um, so the fact that it's being so destroyed right now like, is awful. I don't know what the solution is, but I do think people should be more angry about what teachers are having to do, because yeah. it's just ridiculous to imagine that a teacher can keep 30, 30 students' attention at year eight, year nine, you know, to, to do something um, 
it's just awful. Like the the I think it's I'm I'm happy when I go when I've done these workshops in schools because it's me, a gallery assistant, and um, and a teacher. So there's three of us. So you can actually make good stuff happen. But I don't know how you do it, and I, you know I wish you the best, and I really hope that some that it gets more media attention or something, and people get more angry mm -hmm. about what's happening in secondary mm -hmm. schools, especially academies. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you you have Quick. to you have to see the thing that fires you up yourself because you can't go in there every day if you don't know that. Do you, do you see me? That that's kind of what I'm saying. It's a job. You got to do this. You got to deliver this. You got to deliver that. But what's 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 firing you up to go in there to do that? And that's the thing that you find a way to relate but to. But it can become impossible, though. Yeah. I've taught 30 wait, wait. and 40 kids. You know, it's not impossible. It's difficult. It's very difficult. Exactly. It starts here. It's a and Briefly, because we need to move on. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I think it is definitely about what you're teaching that sustains interest. So regardless of how big the classes are, I think if you're teaching stuff that's relevant and interesting, the kids will respond. But it brings me back to the point of... Um, establishments like take and their representation of um, kind of minority groups of um, artists because as uh, my friend Meryl said we teach in Dagenham which and so the student population is majority black African so when I do my kind of art history lessons I have kind of be up past like the 20th century there's not much to pull from so it's, it's about and then I did a trip to the Tate Britain a few weeks ago and I was walking around and I was very aware of the fact that majority of my children were uh, black or brown students and we was looking at walls of art filled with uh, white men. And it just, those kinds of situations really kind of reinforce those ideas. So I think it is very important that places like Tate have that representation so that kids mm -hmm. of, and the future generations have things to um, be inspired by so they can see that they're being acknowledged as well. So I think... Yeah, that was. If I you take my email, I'll send you a list of like black British artists that you can include in your in your class because there's I've got. Lot, lot. Yeah, but why should we be having to do these big Googles when all these institutions yeah. that we pay for with our taxes um, don't feature our peers' work? But take them to see Yinka's show at the Stephen Friedman because it's a whole lot of contemporary uh, African uh, um, centric art in there. It's it's enormous. Well, and I think Badisha's right to ask the question, and, 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 and the Stephen Freeman show, that's a really good example that Bonnie's bringing, because there are, uh, so Tate doesn't have it in its collection, but there are places that do, and I think that's why somewhere like the Liverpool Biannual is a really good example, because they're really working very hard to make sure there are representations from many different places and many different people within it, not only in the artwork, but also in the people that are running the biannual. Exactly, the yeah. choosers, the curators, yeah, the gatekeepers, exactly. the people that we never see. That There's not enough level. of that. There's but there are some level people trying to do of it. management yeah. that we never usually see, even at events like this. They're sort of up. Yeah. They're literally up there yeah. having a meeting. Exactly. About, exactly. about the outcomes of this event. Yes, there weren't many at um, the discussion today, were there? They stayed away in droves. Yes. Uh, okay, who else? Right at the back. Excellent. Make the mic bearers run. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so there's two things that I, I kind of wanted uh, to say. I'm from Brazil, and uh, one thing that I find is the, the, like the, the biggest struggle in talking about art that doesn't come from the West is the fact that people know little to nothing about the current situation in Brazil. They don't, or in Brazil or in Latin America or anywhere that isn't America or the <laughs> Europe in general. Um, so my question is basically, how can you internationalize the conversation about art activism and how can you connect people? Because there's incredible artists in Brazil, like queer artists, black artists that are making amazing art with no resources and no places will take stuff about them because every time that I say like, oh, I would really like to talk about this actually, they will say like, oh no, but you need to give an entire background about what Brazil is <laughs> so that you can talk about these people and the incredible stuff that they're doing. And another stuff as well about um, art in schools, uh, in public schools in Brazil, if there is uh, any kind of art class, it's already a very <laughs> rare occurrence and 
you know, it's 50, 60 students per class in, in public schools, but you never know what someone is gonna see, even if the art is so detached from them and stuff, but you never know what someone's gonna see, so it always, it needs to be there, and it's a huge, uh, I have friends who are like working on getting people to uh, come into more touch with art, because we just don't have it around. So it, it really is important, even if it looks, uh, you know, that it's <laughs> not as relevant. Yeah in this context because there are so many museums and et cetera, you need that in school as well. Anyway. Thank you very much. So what we have is race representations and institutions and selecting practices, but also this great question about how do we get beyond this idea of there are certain sort of hot spots that we all talk about. So we were America watching all the time or we're Western Europe watching all the time and yet a really global vision still eludes us. Plus that final point about normalizing art lessons and art practice, making it not some special rare thing and giving art students the kind of instruction and attention and the art education they deserve. So whoever wants to take one of those well, first. Well, art has always been a triumvirate. It's about the creative, it's about the collector, and it's about the critic. So, you know, uh, it exists um, for all of those things. I mean, I was in New York in the 80s when that whole scene in uh, uh, Below Houston, Mary Boone Gallery, and uh, uh, all those different artists were there. Um, they existed and they were doing very well, but they weren't visible. So you have to ask yourself, what does that mean? What does that mean and why do you want it? If, you know, talking about internationalized Brazilian artists, to what end? You know, if it's, if it's about making a living, I'm, I'm, I'm just, these are just questions, not judgments, but if it's about making a living, it's about having a pavilion at the Venice Biennale, is it about being able to be in the collection of Steve, whatever his name is, in Las Vegas? Is it about being written up in art news? Is it about getting an award? What is it about? And I think when people, when we, we need to be honest about that because internationalizing something, what does it mean? And, and, and in effect, internationalization for me, to me, is intrusion. So, you know, the answers are personal answers and they're cultural answers. And I'm only putting them out there as questions, not that I have any answers. Um, but I think sometimes we walk around and we're very angry about things and we don't know why we're angry about them, but actually what we really want is to get a good review in the Times. And people, people should be honest about that because there's a path to that, there's a route to that, but you have to be honest about where you're heading and you gotta know. And, and these are the things that I'm learning about, again, at this point in my life, I'm still asking myself those questions too. So when those things come out, that, that's how I've, I respond. You know, Bonnie, what, can, what I, you can I ask you, what's wrong with wanting all of those things? I, I mean, didn't why, say it was wrong. Why should we behave like Mother Teresa, like, okay, no opportunity is fine, I didn't say it was, I didn't say, I didn't say it was I wrong, mean. I was saying don't be unconscious. I didn't say it was wrong. But I don't think artists are unconscious, no, I think no, artists are really ambitious. No, no if someone's, no, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, you know, the path to this place is a path of conformity. You know, if you, if you want to go there, if you want to get that RA, there's a certain language and, and things that you have to practice so that the people who give you the RA can recognize you. And you can't go and say, I want, I want to be in the Royal Academy, but I don't want, you know, there's, there's got to be, you got to be conscious about the path to that. And either you accept it, or you, that's why I was saying at the beginning what I was saying about outside. It's like you have to be conscious that, that you have to go on that path. You can fight all the way. You can fight the establishment, but you are getting into the establishment as well. That, that's my point. Is there any way of hanging on to all of your politics and still having a headline show at the Tate? Because I really want one of those. <laughs> um, yeah, you can. You can do that, but you gotta you gotta be honest with yourself all 180 degrees. Don't bullshit yourself and don't bullshit anybody else because if having a headline show at the Tate is your validation of yourself and your art, hey, I, I'd like to get a Pulitzer. That's my validation to me. 
but I shouldn't mess with myself about it because that's what a lot of people do. We sit at home at midnight and we're pissed off because we're working our asses off and we don't get jack shit because we don't admit to ourselves, I really want to be there. I want to be there. I want to be there, like the Jackson Five yeah. say, you know, so. That's <laughs> I think that's, oh, sorry. Can I just answer that? Yeah, let's I think you have to answer, for, for me, it's like, you have to ask, why, why do you want to be there? Who's exactly. there? Exactly. The dry exactly. people, the people who went to private school, exactly. the people who are fussy yes. and dry yes. and boring. Ask, ask Come yourself. on, like, I feel like I've always, like, the people who are, like, on the outside are always the best people, you know? It's like Audrey Lord says, those of us who love in doorways, and I always take that line of that poem as being the people but who, some are, people who don't, are not really invited in. The but some people just, don't know that they, that they, that, that they actually want to be inside. They don't really they know that. Be, mm, I have to be careful because I'm about to start working here. Um, <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. That's all right. You know, maybe don't give up people want to be inside for different reasons, taking. you know? No, but I'm not, not everybody I'm not, wants wait, wait, to, like, have a, have a little office think, at the top. It's not a judgment. Education goes back to what you do in secondary school, what you're allowed to do in secondary school in the small confine of space you have. One of the problems is that not enough alternative um, routes are allowed. Yeah. So this one is privileged. So that's why there's the desperation <coughs> around it. You know, so that's why, Vadisha, you want to have your politics and the, the major show, solo show, okay? But, you know. I've only made one seven minute film. It would be a very bare Exhibition. Hey, my, fa game. my fantasy, my That's fantasy is that like I get Louis That's Bourgeois moment because, working. as everyone knows, women artists work till we're ninety, and then just exactly. before we die, we get like exactly. the big prize. You get the show one day, but like it's got to be like a, when you've actually retired or like a, when so you're I'm literally on, on your this. deathbed. I'm counting on this. No, it's actually. I'm Louise Bourgeois age now, so I'm really excited. No, it's actually we're after your dead. That's I know. I can't wait. I fill the auditorium. Death is the battle. There'll be a really big like exhibition. Exhibition catalog yeah, and yeah, loads yeah, of yeah. essays. Yeah, yeah. Da 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 da. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um, uh, t no, the serious, serious point is that we need to offer alternative understanding about what art work is. There are many brilliant ways of inhabiting. Like, um, you know, look at everybody in this room. You you will all be inhabiting this thing that we call the art world um, in many many different ways. You'll be earning your money in different ways you know, portfolio careers. I will have to laugh at that one. But you know, <laughs> at, or, or, but there's, there's, but they'll, they'll, you'll be doing that or, and you'll, but you'll also, you'll be completely passionate about working in a very small marginalized community center that is, somebody was talking about this really eloquently at the end of our workshop today. I think that um, the, the problem is that at, in education, we tend to, because we haven't got enough time and because we have to get people to pay, particularly in higher education, we tend to only offer this one route. And there are many, many routes. There's many ways. Yeah, and they many should ways. all be valued. Many ways. And it's a strange irony that actually, I'll come to you in a second, uh, is that this community art working outreach route is actually often better funded for art workers than just trying to make it as a fine artist where you're sort of you're on your own and you might have a great show in a great gallery but you don't make any money from it no one actually buys your work your dealer takes 70 percent yes of because income. of the way yeah. the art world is structured but in actual fact doing these endless workshops where you think god they're really exploiting my labor as a, a person of color i'm do, you know everything i'm doing is sort of downwards focused actually makes gives you a living in a very realistic way, which is not to be not to be sniffed at, and is very spiritually in, enriching and very educational, of course. But it's not what you want. I mean, it goes back to what you were saying. It's not what you want in your head, in your fantasy of, of what success might be. But you got to be honest. Right at the front, and then there was one behind you. So let's come to you, and then we'll come to you, and we'll take yours two together. Thank you. I have two points. Uh, let's accept it that prejudice exists. Everybody's got their pre preconceived ideas. I'm not black. However, the moment I open my mouth, I've seen it countless times when people will degrade anything, not only with me, but with other people. But this is not the point I want to raise today. The point is that uh, you inspired me about a very, very important, important element. My profession, I'm a choreographer. And I've worked with quite a few institutions in the UK. Uh, what I wanted to raise today is a question for the panel. Um, what are the institutions, i.e. schools, universities, in order to empower students and artists to not leave the institutions, i.e. as I did, uh, they were very happy to get 30,000 pounds, 
because I'm not from an EC country, I had to pay 12,000 pounds a year. And yet they taught me how to do more pirouettes, how to do more release, how to conceptualize more. And yet, like me, 99% of other choreographers and dancers, when they left that door, were absolutely unprepared for what was expecting them out there. So I think we're failing. I've got two children, 12 and 11. Okay. So we, I think we're failing that. So what, what could mm. be your mm. your answer or your Maybe we should take opinion? Question. Let's take the next one because it's a great question. When, once you leave the institution that set you up, you spent so much money, you're in debt by the age of 21, and you get out there into the wild west of making a career. Let's hear from you. Arching ideas and themes which have come out of this discussion, Please. but link back more widely to some of the theory behind why we're here. And just to bring up a few themes, you talk about uh, the I2 Europe or the I2 America in a very centric way, which means that all other nations become marginalized on the periphery almost. And I wonder what alternative routes there are for that expression. And I'm also a bit concerned also that there's no mention of class as yet. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to bring that up as a very real um, uh, category that we work with, which is becoming um, almost invisible in the same way that race is also becoming invisible and is almost off the agenda. But everybody knows that class exists and it's, you can smell it, whether it's, you know, poshos from Eton or kids from Dagenham. Everyone knows that there is a thing called class and it's becoming invisible. And I'm a bit concerned that it hasn't raised its head in the, in the discussion as yet. So I want to really put right. that back in the centre uh, with race, with uh, intersectionality, and also with this centric vision that we have with our eye to Europe and America. And I want to talk about positionality in that because you're all very different. You not only look different, but you come from very different experiences and different ages, different backgrounds, different expectations for yourself and different expectations in terms of your art practice. And I want to ask a question. And I want to ask whether or not you feel that one of these alternate routes, alternative routes as in uh, where you come from, in the old Gilroy sense, routes where you come from, R-O-O-T-S, and routes as in where we are going, in art and in literature, I'm a writer, can be a place where we create a parallel universe in which writers, artists exist with the canon, with the Western canon. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We don't want to get rid of the Renaissance. We want to join mm. a story yeah. which has been told from this Eurocentric place mm. and include a narrative amongst ourselves which recognizes our value and contribution and which allows expression and which encourages the younger generations to see that we have left them a legacy that they look to and they can be proud of. So that's my question. Thank How you. do we do that? Should we do that? Is that a real possibility? Excellent. Okay, so uh, let's get the let's start with the most recent one and then move backwards. And then there's a separate question which we have to tackle. So alternative routes and routes, how do we coexist with the canon? How do we address the great unspoken, which I think is a really British thing, which is not talking about class, even though it's steeped in every, it's like oxygen, it's everywhere, but no one talks about it. Um, and then getting away from the idea of being very centered on a kind of Anglo-American Western European history as though that's the center of the universe, that's the sort of weight, the, the center of gravity of the universe, looking in a more multipolar way. Do I respond to that? Yes, you can. Then we go on to how do institutions prepare you slash don't prepare you for a career. But let's do this one. yours um, first. Yeah, I think that's an amazing question. Um, I have to like, like I, I, I think my art practice and uh, the practice of my collective, which is called Sorry You Feel Uncomfortable, S-Y-F-U, um, is, is really like relevant to that in the sense that like I'm always trying to center like artists and voices from the Caribbean, which is my ancestry. So whether it's like painting people, I have a black history and black history calendars that come out, which is all usually people from Africa and the Caribbean illustrated, but also the collective Sorry You Feel Uncomfortable, um, what we do is we try and um, 
have collective readings where everybody reads one. We take a text, and you know, we've done Edward Glisson and um, Sylvia Winter, like academics from from different places in the Caribbean. Um, lots of different people from the Caribbean, actually, and we'll, we'll work collectively through. Because the thing about academia, I find, is being from a working class background, I'm sure there's lots of working class people who love academia, but I find it a bit exclusionary sometimes and um, a bit elitist. Um, and, you know, but then there's so much great academia from the Caribbean, um, and, and, and not just obviously poetry, loads of stuff. But, um, mm. So what we do as a collective is we take text and when we try it, we, we get everybody to sit in a circle and we read sentence by sentence by sentence, making sure that there's time to pause and to, to um, break down and say, do we, all, do we actually understand what we're talking about? Um, and then the other thing is, like, I think kind of answering that question about like, being prepared, I don't know. Like, I feel like maybe people should, I'm surprised that people go into university thinking that it's gonna like, do anything. Like, as a black student, it was pretty obvious from the beginning that university was like, it didn't, I had so many great experiences, but I didn't feel like it was uh, really a space for black art. Um, at all, and I'm doing a master's now, and it's repeating again. I'm seeing like modules that are so relevant to blackness, like even have decolonization in the title of the, the module, and it doesn't mention black artists or black theory at all. So I don't know where this like assumption that universities are going to give us like a little backpack and make us like be able to <laughs> be be visible in the world. Um, and then in terms of like back to working class artists, I really feel like there's such an amazing art scene right now in London. Like there's so many cool artists doing so many cool things and also not just doing things, but supporting each other. You see a Bond dance in the audience who is an incredible poet and should all check out her, I think, yeah. Um, and the, there's this, const I'm constantly seeing the faces all over the place of like artists who are just so good and like their work is so fire and so powerful. And like, I know that we're all buying each other's work and supporting each other and like, um, making spaces for each other and um, I feel like there is like I don't know I think it's a great time I think it's I know it probably goes in circles but right now it feels like a really beautiful time where people are I think it's a great time. supporting each other and empowering each other and creating a, a scene for each time, other I, mean, I think a lot of maybe white artists come out of university and are like what but like I think it, what I'm seeing is that black artists seem to have a lot of solidarity with each other in universities and they're like realizing that you know I'm seeing that because I've seen a quite a few degree shows and I see that people are friends and it's like, oh, you know this person, oh, you're working with that person, oh, you do know each other. I don't know, I just feel like, don't expect the institution to prepare you because it's a business at the end of the day. Like, um, Can I just put that to uh, um, Andrea and Bonnie because that seems to me to be a very, very positive attribute of the so-called millennial generation that yeah. whatever older generations worry about the instability and the poverty of opportunities, actually, if you talk to a 20 year old, they are amazingly survivalist. This instability is their normal. So they're very on board with it. Yeah. They don't expect anyone to help them. They are very much about DIY creative. They're highly mm. networked. So if they can't get a show in a gallery, they're like, okay, we will find a space we'll generate the work and we'll make it happen. There's a, an amazing degree of motivation, but then I also look at them and I think, but you deserve right. funding and support and to be empowered to make a body of work. You shouldn't have to scrub about every time you want to put on a group show. You mm -hmm. deserve to have long careers and to flourish in your creativity. Well, I, I used it to answer your question because it's the easiest and then, um, I used to be a university chancellor, and one of the things that was very important was that the students at this particular university could go out into the world to work. So it depends on the school. Um, I was quite shocked to discover uh, at Oxford, for instance, my background's a theater, uh, they don't have a theater at mm. Oxford. And because that's not what it's about. Whereas they have one at Cambridge, so it depends on what the university exists for, what, what, why it's there. Is it there for theory? Is it there for practice? What is it about? And I, I also used to be on the board of the Royal Opera House, so we were connected with the Royal uh, Ballet School at White Lodge. And that school was absolutely focused on getting people into the core. You know? So it, 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 really, it really depends on what the school is for. If your school is turning out people to do certain things. So I think in a sense, um, I, I, I like universities that are about theory. I love that. I love that people can sit and think and think and think and not have to really sort of go out and do. I love being able to, to, to have a, a school like that. And also the schools where you can 
you know, know the business because that's that's what you're talking about. It's like what how do you get out there and what do you what do you have to do? And I know, for instance, at the core, the ballet, the ballet ma mistress would go up and down, and you know as a choreographer, especially with ballet, they know when you're 10 years old what you're going to be doing. They, yeah. they can tell by your body. So they were, do, 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 do. these were the Oof. chorus girls, this was going to be a prima ballerina, this was going to be this. So, um, and I love what you're saying, too, about, about millennials now. I think that they are... Uh, I love them because I think they are geared to survive. They're geared to be individuals. They're geared to make. They're geared to do. So I think it's okay that they don't actually know because sometimes if you don't know, you can actually break the, break the vase and make the new thing because you're ignorant. And ignorance is a beautiful thing. Um, what about the tougher questions, the ones about yes. roots and coexisting? Yes, with the I, kind of, we're shying away from the tough questions. Well, well no, 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 like no. I, oh, sorry. No, no, no. You no, I was going to say as a writer, um, I, I personally, um, if you say exist with the canon or exist alongside the canon or, or alongside the canon, I would ask why is that important? Mm -hmm. and, 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 it, and I'm not saying that as a judgment. I'm, I'm saying that I think every writer has to ask themselves, why does it matter? Why does it matter? And, and every day I think you confront that with your piece of paper and your pen or your typewriter or whatever. You, you have to ask as a writer, why are you doing this? What is it for? What do you want to accomplish? Not only in your own expression, but there is the canon. There is not only the canon, there's a canon of critics. There's a whole sort of bastion of prizes. This society gives people prizes as a way to class people. So we in this society, we aim for prizes because that's another way that you're levered up into the class. And we have to get rid of the prizes. If we get rid of some of these prizes, it's very important because then it allows people to breathe and to make their work. And the prizes actually make the class system. That's another class yeah. system in this country. Mm -hmm. I think that we should never accept these prizes unless we can use the prize as a leverage for those with us that we can give the prize over. If you can actually give the prize away, I think that that's the most important thing. But the canon is your canon. And, and, and how do you build your own, and I'm not saying that facetiously, I think it's very important because to be a writer is a great act of courage and to be a black woman writer, any kind of, a woman writer is a courageous act because we make the body of work every moment we sit down with that piece of paper. That's our canon. Very important. Uh, Andrew, before we come to you, Bonnie, you're pooping on all my dreams. Now you want to get away with the prizes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die penniless still living with my mom. That's right. <laughs> but it's all going to be no, no moment. You die. I, I, I took my this. OBE <laughs> for the very reason that I could pin it on my mother's uh, uh, grave. And that's what I did. She, in fact, she was always chic all the way to the end. So when I looked in the coffin, she even had the perfect dress on that matched the OBE ribbon. So she's got it and it's oh, in amazing. the ground. And that's oh, exactly why I took it. That's a great place for an OBE. Oh. She was always chic. <laughs> she was always chic, always to the end. Um, I, so to come back to, I think these, I think yeah, the question of this. class is really important. And, and uh, I think your, you, your question needs like, hours of unpicking mm, but just of two things yeah. okay yeah. that just two immediate responses the first is that in my experience of talking uh, of speaking being with um, artists and other um, workers um, particularly in the field of higher education that there is a there is a, a masses of thinking and action and political action around class that is coming out of s scholarship but it's not in the arts it's happening in cultural studies, it's happening in sociology, it's happening in media and communications, it's happening in engineering, it's not happening in the arts. So that's one thing I'd say that we need to correct, we need to think about it. But as I said, uh, you know, at my very beginning, and as Badish said, we all know this, but it's really, I know it sounds obvious, but when I say that inequality is intersectional, what I mean is that class and race cannot be divided when we're trying to analyse how to tackle inequality. So I, I kind of agree with you. But the other thing I would say is that the, having s done all that, the art world loves a white middle-class boy. Yeah? 
and the art market loves a white middle class boy. And that comes from a very particular tradition. And academia as well, I think, does it? Yeah, well, well because, acad yeah, because the, you know, um, art academia and the art world are kind of interlinked. I mean, particularly financially and more and more so now, when you think about uh, either yourself or your carer or your parent having to cough up the money to pay for your education, then, you know, there's a question about how that, whether, what the value of that is financially as well, which is also, which is directly impacting on questions of class as well. So I think it's complicated. Clive, question right at the front. We've got eight minutes, so we'll oh, come to you. Da, da, da. <laughs> Maybe we should just have questions. Maybe we Thank should have you. solutions and not keep <laughs> digging ourselves into the thing. Clive Monker. Okay, um, I'll be concise. I'd like to ask a question that tries to relocate this whole discussion to one of the central themes of the event, which is this question around art as a tool of social analysis and art as a tool of social and systemic change. Um, what kind of criteria should and can be using to assess when a cultural artifact or a text is purporting to be challenging inequalities, be it racial, gendered, social, or economic? How do you identify this? But equally, is there an inherent contradiction in when artists who are purporting to be using their work to kind of challenge social inequality are actually existing and exhibiting their work within the same institutions absolutely. that are actually endorsing the inequalities yeah, that are challenged? Absolutely. I'd say, how is it subverting? How is it um, like okay. undermining? How is it in, like in, infecting the view with something um, that, that undermines the dominant power structures, be they white supremacy, um, capitalism, heteropatriarchy, ableism? Like, if it's not doing any of those things, then you've identified that it's not. Sorry, I mean, just because we're running out of time. Sorry you felt, <laughs> sorry you not. feel uncomfortable at, Glass, at the Glasgow International. Um, sorry, I'm going to try and rephrase you as well, asked a very important question, which was how are you tackling white supremacy? And, and, and that was a question that really needed to be asked of Glasgow International. And I asked that question of the curator. And, and what did they say? He said, well, Just we <laughs> we're, we're not. But I mean, the question is, so, so I guess your question is how, so, so that's one way of identifying where it's not happening. Yeah. And there was a second part of the question, wasn't there? Which was, how can, even if an art piece does that, what does it matter if it's sitting there on a plinth in the middle of a really upscale, super unrepresentative, famous art institution? I always think, um, because the root of everything for me is jazz. And what jazz musicians do is use the contradiction. Always use the contradiction. If whatever it is in yourself, your work, your life, use the contradiction and push the contradiction. And when you find that you've got an answer, you use the contradiction to break that up. There's always going to be moments where folks are going to walk up to you and say, what the hell are you doing in the Tate? I thought you were supposed to be for the people. Well, yeah, I am for the people, a whole lot of people. There are a whole lot of people. OK, so use the contradiction. And, I, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm begging you to do that, because what happens is we get tied up in these boxes. We get tied up in these things where we're this, we're that, we're this, we're that. You know, the thing is, do your work and use the contradiction of your work. And then your work will speak to people because that's how we live anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's about being alive, basically. And, you know, they've just, in, in the Tate Britain, actually, if you're here again with your class, there's a new room that's there, which is loads of black British artists. And you know, the, I'm, I'm making a graphic novel at the moment, which is about my encounters. And the story is kind of spinning off from um, the painting that's, here, that's in the Tate Britain by Sonia Boyce called Layback keep mm -hmm. quiet and think of what made Britain so great. Um, and when I saw that painting after walking through the Artists and Empire exhibition and feeling exhausted <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and feeling like, wow, like uh, feeling a lot of emotions, but seeing Sonia Boyce's face looking out of a painting at me and asking that question and to ask me to lay back, keep quiet and think of what made Britain so great, it like rehumanized me actually. And it made me feel like, oh my God, someone else in this exhibition gets the feeling that I get. Um, and I think that's vital. And, and, and also Labena Himid's work is there as well. It, recently in South London Gallery, it led a workshop with a, a group of school children, almost all black and, F, uh, black and brown. Um, and 
we, I got them to shout the, the text from the sculpture out, which is, we will be who we want, when we want, where we want, and the place is now, and the time is here. Now, now, now! Here, here, here! Now, 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 now! And everyone's like looking like, what, there's children screaming! <laughs> and it's like, and then one of the feedback was from the, the young people was like, I didn't like it when there was other people in the gallery. And I was like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> like, this is our gallery today. <gasps> I want to say something really fast, that I'm, I'm going to be doing some work here as a theater artist because I'm sick of the theater. So the thing is, I want to work with visual artists, I want to work with musicians more, more, more. And if you're a painter or a sculptor, get the fuck out of the art world and go work with people yeah. who do other stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just keep yeah. pushing your practice and your mind and your work and just explode yourself up. If you're a choreographer, go work it. Work with some writers. That is the most mm. wonderful kind of coming mm. together. Just keep pushing it. Yeah, push it. Uh, we push have it. three minutes left. So after having covered a huge amount of terrain, after having not got too oh negative, God. but also been uh, confronted with some hard questions <coughs> which are going to need a lot more thought and consideration, which we can talk about over drinks afterwards, perhaps. Um, I would ask one for just line each. One line each, final thoughts. Andrew will come to you, then Jacob, then Bonnie. Oh, okay. Um, uh, uh, I would put my energy into creating infrastructural change in institutions. That's what I do. Excellent. Jacob? What am I saying? Like, how to end yeah, white supremacy? Well, yeah, we talk. <laughs> I, I said, I said, right, you're going to I would yeah. put my, my energy into ending white supremacy. <laughs> Mm, I put my I energy said at the into beginning my punk that bands and yeah. my, my comics. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, and carrying on creating yes. and taking yeah. up space as an artist. Bonnie? Be a renegade. Anytime anybody puts you in a box, break out the fucking box. That's yeah. what I do. Yeah. And I'd uh, recall that first excellent question, which was we need to go forward into radical utopias and imagined futures of revolutionary creation. Thank you very much, yeah. everyone. Thanks to you. I just want to say a few thank yous. Thanks to Richard Clive Lewis and Tram at Tate and LSE. Thanks to Bonnie Greer, Jacob V. Joyce and Andrea Phillips. And thank you enormously to the staff here at Star Cinema and the Claw Learning Center who kept us well lit, well heard, cooled, fed and watered throughout the day. Thanks to you, you've been a fantastic audience. Enjoy your evening, thank you very much. Go forth and enjoy. Well done everyone, thank you very much.